Prayer. Practical, practical prayer. prayer. That's what we're studying about. Practical mm -hmm. prayer. Mm -hmm. Experiencing the delight of a practical prayer life. And we're looking at 12 steps or 12 elements of, of prayer. Some of them you will use uh, at various times in your life or in your prayer devotion. Sometimes you might go through all 12 and if you spent five minutes on each one, you will have prayed an hour. And the whole basis of this is, could you not watch with me one hour? Mm -hmm. And uh, these are 12 elements or aspects of prayer that are found in the scriptures, and we've been dealing with the first three. This is, this is step four. This is aspect number four. And what we're looking at is scripture praying, or praying the word of God. Now, I want to begin tonight by saying the Word of God is especially crucial to our devotional time of prayer because it's our degree of belief that determines the outpouring of God's blessing. It's as simple as this. If you don't have faith, nothing's going to happen. If you have faith, something's going to happen. If you believe, you shall receive. If you don't believe, you won't receive. But uh, in order to have faith, and we're going to talk about that, in order to have faith, we have to trust and believe the Word of God. So the first aspect of here is scriptural praying. It is an act of faith appropriation. So it's faith appropriated. The Bible says faith without works is what? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to appropriate our faith, and what is that appropriation going to be based on? The Word of God. It's what God says. You see, we can never expect to grow in spiritual competence if we're not getting knowledge from the Word of God. We can't grow in our life without the Word of God. That's why so many, and unfortunately so many Christians today are weak in faith, they're weak in discipleship, they're weak in godliness and holiness because they don't know the Word. David said, I'm going to hide the Word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against God. So it's the Word of God that acts as a barrier and a, a bulwark against the sins of the world because we're hiding His Word in our heart. So there's a, the action focus here is empowerment. So Scripture praying is going to empower your prayer based upon the Word of the Lord. And the key word is fortification. You know, it's applying the Word of God, the great Creator. It's do you know that the, it's applying the promises of God? Did you know that someone figured out that there are 365 promises of God for the believer? Now, there's some promises for the unbeliever as well. Mm -hmm. But for the believer, there's 365 promises. Someone counted them all up for the believer. That means you get a promise a day. Every day you have a promise of God. And yet, all these promises are for us each and every day. We don't, we don't need to stop and pick out one here and there because all the promises of God are for us. The Word of God is especially crucial to our devotional time of prayer. Our degree of belief determines the outpouring of God's power. F. B. Meyer said, though the, though the Bible be crowded with golden promises from cover to cover, Yet will they be inoperative until we turn to them in prayer. Amen. When we turn to the promises of God in prayer. I like what, uh, I believe this one is Leonard Ravenhill. He said, one of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God and read and believe it. The rest of us will be embarrassed. We have adopted the convenient theory that the Bible is a book to be explained, whereas first and foremost, it is a book to be believed, and then after that, to be obeyed. Amen. Leonard Ravenhill, Why Revival Tarries. So we look at the Scripture of God. Now here's what the Word of the Lord says. Ephesians 6.17 It says, put on salvation as your helmet or put on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the spirit which is 
the Word of God. You know what all this begins with? Be strong in the Lord. And the implication here is God saying to you and me, go get some strength. <coughs> well, where do we get the strength? Where do we get the power to combat the enemy? He says, you put on the helmet of salvation. Number one, I am a child of God. I belong to Him. You put on that helmet of salvation that protects your mind. And then you take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So he says, go get strong. That's how you get strong. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Does not my word burn like fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes a rock to pieces? God's Word is powerful. Amen. Hebrews 4, 12 tells us, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's quick. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. <coughs> Who can divide soul and spirit? Where does one end and the other one begin? Well, God knows how to do that. Amen. Man does not know. Man does not know where, you know, generally where the bone ends and the m m marrow begins. We have some ideas about it. But see, God's Word is quick and it's powerful. So many of us sometimes fail in, in our victory in our walk with the Lord simply because we're not exposing ourselves to the Word of God. That's quick and powerful. We succumb to the enemy because we don't have the Word of God in our life. So when we pray the Scriptures, we are praying something that God said, that Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. But what? My Word will not pass away. See, if you don't know what to pray, pray the Word. Pray Scriptures. Open up the book of Psalms and start praying them. Most of them are songs anyway. They're poems. They're, they're praying. David understood that, and he wrote a majority of them, of, of those psalms. Which brings us to the next one, Psalm 56, verses 4 and 10. In God I will praise His Word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. Why? Because I put my faith and my trust in the Word of God. He says, in God I will praise His Word in verse 10. In the Lord I will praise His Word. Well, that's what we're talking about, Scripture praise. You know, a lot of times our praying is, uh, is, is limited to us, us giving God our request. And when we get through, we get up and say, okay, God, now you bless me, and we go on about our way. And then when God doesn't answer exactly the way we thought he should, or when he should, or how he should, we sometimes can get offended and mad at God. And yet the word of the Lord says we, we need to trust the word of the Lord. He says in the word of God, I will praise his word. I will I will. I, I will Praise His Word. Twice He says in this passage, I will pray His Word. Praise His Word. And then in, um, in Numbers, the 23rd chapter, verses 19 and 20, God is not man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should repent. Has He said, and will He not do? Or has He spoken, and will He not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He is blessed, and I cannot... Reverse it. Wonderful promise of God. He has promised us something. I can tell you a promise. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He told the disciples, you go and I'll go with you. Even unto the end of the age. So when our, our, our minds and our spirits tell us that God is a million miles away, the Word of God comes to remind us that God never forsakes us. He never leaves us alone. Our emotions may tell us that. That God's forsaken. Our mind may even tell us that. But you see, our, the Word of God promises you and me that regardless of what you and I will face, God is always with us. He is with us. He said nothing. Paul said what? Nothing. Did you hear that? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And all the things that he mentioned are all external. <coughs> are all things that you and I will encounter. Not life, death, principalities, powers. Doesn't matter. 
Good things, bad things, storms, difficulties, blessings. He goes down a list of things, and then if he forgets something, he says, there any other creature or any other situation or circumstance? Mm -hmm. right. Nothing separates me from his love. Amen. And that you and I can depend on. Yes. Amen. So even in our crying out to God in difficult situations and circumstances, we can pray that word mm -hmm. that says, I'm not separated from God's love. Right. I may feel like it. I may think it for the moment, but I'm not. God has spoken. Amen. He is blessed. And He cannot reverse it. So God's Word, God's Word is the true prayer book. Mm -hmm. I know some denominations, some mainline churches have their prayer book, but God's Word is the prayer book. Amen. Amen. And not only that, Ian Bound says, prayer projects faith on God <coughs> and God on the world. Only God can move mountains, but faith and prayer moves God. He abounds. So it's a time to, it is a time to appropriate the Word of God to our prayer time. To let God know. Here's what uh, Charles Spurgeon said years ago. Every promise of Scripture is a writing of God which may be pleaded before Him. I like that. Every promise of Scripture is a writing of God which may be pleaded before Him with this reasonable request. Do as thou hast said. God, do what you said. The Creator will not cheat the creature who depends upon this truth. And far more, the Heavenly Father will not break His word to His own children. Amen. So we can pray the scriptures because the scriptures is the writing of God and that we can take those scriptures and those promises and we can pray them to the Lord. You know, David said, even his enemies, he says, I, 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 I prayed about that. I prayed the word of God, that God will not forsake me. So scripture praying is a prayer application that employs God's word. That employs God's word. God has some promises for you and me, doesn't he? Amen. And he has things that he wants to give us. I, I think about pleading God's promises. And um, I, want, I want to share a couple things w w with you. You see, the word of God is more than a foundation for effective praying. It is the substance of effective praying. And God can do what no other can do. Here's what he says in his word, Andrew Murray. Little of the word of God with little prayer is death to the spiritual life. He says, little of the word of God with little prayer is death to the spiritual life. But he goes on to say, much of the word with little prayer gives a sickly life. So you may be in the word, but you're not praying. Much prayer with little of the word gives more life, but without steadfastness. Because it's the Word of God that nails your feet to the floor. What did Jesus say in John 4? They that worship God must worship Him in what? Spirit, spirit, spirit and in truth. <coughs> Praying in the Spirit. The Spirit of God. And the truth of God. The Word of God. Somebody said if you uh, worship God in truth alone, you dry up. If you worship God in spirit alone, you blow up. But if you worship God in spirit and truth, you grow up. Amen. Amen. He says a full measure of the word and prayer each day gives a healthy and powerful life. Can you say amen? Amen. Amy Carmichael said, the only thing that matters in our warfare is how is to throw all the energies of our being into the faithful use of this precious blade, the sword of God's word. The sword of God's word. So he goes on to say, there's a life application. We can claim specific promises of God. We can claim specific promises 
of God. I, uh, maybe you, I, I've mentioned this man before, uh, George Mueller, who was a director of an orphanage for children in England and London the last century. He was a man of faith and prayer. He stated at over 90 years old, I have never had an unanswered prayer. I have never had an unanswered prayer. He claimed the secret to receiving answers to prayer lies in how the Christian applies God's word in prayer. Now there's another story about, about George Bueller that a good friend of him that he had prayed for, his son prayed for his son to come to the Lord all of his life. And when George Mueller passed away, this son had not come to the Lord. Now, George Mueller always felt God will answer prayer. He may not answer at the time that I, I want him to, but God will answer the prayer. This, this good friend's son came to George Mueller's funeral, and at his funeral, God touched his heart, and he gave his life to the Lord. You see, God answers prayer. He says, I always pray with an open Bible. I constantly had filled his petitions with God's word. He would not voice a request without a word from God to back it. George Mueller, 90 years old, I've never had an unanswered prayer. Describing his devotional hour, he said, The first thing I did after having asked in a few words the Lord's blessings upon his precious word was to begin to meditate on the Word of God. Searching as it were into every verse to get a blessing out of it. Not for the sake of public ministry or the Word, uh, public ministry of the Word, nor for the sake of preaching on what I meditated upon. But for the sake of obtaining food for my soul. The result I have found to be almost invariably this. That after a very few minutes, my soul has been led to confession, or to thanksgiving, or to intercession, or to supplication, so that I did not, as it were, give myself to prayer, but to meditation, yet it turned almost immediately, more or less, to prayer. As he meditated upon God's Word, he began to pray the Word of God. You see, you and I can claim the promises of God. Amen. We can claim the promises of God. We can pray the promises. The Word of God is more than a foundation for effective praying. It is the substance for effective praying. Do you hear that? Yes. It's more than the foundation. It is the substance of effective praying. Because when you and I pray the Scriptures, when we pray the Word of God, that's God's Word. It does not lie. It cannot lie. And I will tell you, it will not return void. Amen. It will accomplish that which God has sent it out to. Just as word brings life to believers, daily walk, it brings life to our prayers. So we think about that. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men or man, but as it is the truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. You hear what Paul is saying? You received it as the word of God, and it is effective in your life. It works effectively in your life to bring about changes in our lives. It is the Word of God that uh, does His work in our lives. That's why He says, Is not my Word like a fire? Is it not like a hammer that breaks? Here's what He says. If there is progress in understanding prayer and depth, it is by the study of the Bible. You see, the more we study the Word of God, the more we are into the Word of God, the more we will pray the Word of God. I love using the phrase out of the Psalms, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. 
you don't know what to pray, open up the book of Psalms and start praying them. Amen. If you come to a roadblock, if you come to an impasse, just open up the Word of God and pray the Scriptures. If you come to a block in your in your spiritual life, in your in your work, get into the Word of God and pray the Scriptures because the Word of God tells you and me that we have access to Him. He said, come boldly before the throne of grace. And he didn't say, with, well, you can't because you've not been a good boy or a good girl. No, he says that you and I can come boldly. That we may obtain what? Mercy. 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 How many need mercy tonight? <laughs> I know I do. That you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because all of us, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we need mercy. None of us have arrived yet, have we? We've got a long way to go to be like our Lord. We have a long way to go to have the faith that we need to have. And yet our faith can grow as we study in the Word of God and we dwell on His promises that He has given us. Amen? Prayerful study of the Bible is indispensable for powerful prayer. Ian Bounds wrote a number of books on prayer. And he was a revivalist. A lawyer during the Civil War. He spent an hour average of four hours in prayer every morning. The Word of God, he says, is the fulcrum upon which the lever of prayer is placed. And by which things are mightily moved. God has placed and committed Himself, His purpose, His promise to prayer. His Word becomes the basis, He said, the inspiration of our praying, and there are circumstances under which by prayer we may obtain an addition or an enlargement of His promises. So we have those to, to base on. Psalms 119.93 says, I will never forget thy precepts. I'll never forget your word. I'll never forget the Holy Scriptures. For with them thou hast quickened me. God's word is quick and it's powerful. We should not forget the word of God. I've watched over the years in my, my own ministry how the succeeding generations are using too much human reasoning to try to figure out God. That's right. If you want to know what God is like, it's right here in the pages. Amen. And let me let me add, you don't add to it, right. and you don't take away from it. Right. And we don't build doctrines between the lines. Right. Amen. We don't build doctrines on the white spaces. We build doctrines on what the Word of God does say. Amen. And that's why the Paul said in, your, in, in his word, he said, let your yea be what? Yea, yea and your nay, nay. Yea, nay. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. And yet he goes on to say that everything in Christ is yes. Amen. Everything in Christ is a yes. It's not a no, it's a yes. Do you hunger after God? Yes. Do you thirst after Him? God, Christ says yes. Yes. Do you seek Him with your heart? Christ says, yes, not no. He doesn't, he doesn't look at you and me and say, you know, uh, you just have not had a good week, so you come back next week, and if you want something from me, uh, then you can. No, no, if you and I reach to Him, even, in, even if we fail, He says, if you confess it, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No wonder that song, the beautiful song is, I need thee, Lord, every hour. I need you. I need you every moment of every day. We may not always acknowledge that, but the truth of the matter is, you and I need the Lord. Oh, yeah. Amen. And we can have that assurance with Him as we pray the Word of God that says, He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He says in Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord? Is it not like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? You know, nothing can withstand the Word of God. That's right. <clears throat> nothing can withstand. He'll take the rock, 
the obstacle and break it to pieces. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Can you say amen? amen. amen. So we look at this fourth aspect or fourth element of prayer and it's scripture praying. We started off with praise. We looked at waiting. Just waiting on the Lord. Be still and know that God, He is God. We looked at the confession. At recognizing our need of Him. And that's what really confession is. I need Thee, Lord. I can't do this on my own. I've had people tell me over the years, well, I'm just not sure I can live in. I said, what do you mean you can't live in? Well, I don't think I can live the Christian life, so I don't want to give it to Him and fail. I said, well, you can't. But Christ in you can. Amen. I like to share a principle in our discipleship class. Because perfection in Christ, perfection in the Lord is relative. By that I mean before you all walk out. <laughs> Let me explain it. Perfection is relative to how long you have had to grow. We don't expect an infant to act like a five-year-old. We don't expect a five-year-old to act like a ten-year-old. But see, that infant can be as perfect as an infant can be. That five-year-old can be as perfect as a five-year-old can be. And that ten-year-old can be as perfect as a ten-year-old. And we don't expect ten-year-olds to act like twenty-year-olds. Neither do we expect twenty-year-olds to act like ten-year-olds. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> But you see, the principle is that as you and I grow in Christ, just as a child grows up, it can be, it doesn't mean that that child is perfect or without fault or without mistake, but they're as perfect as a five year old can be. But as they mature, see, as they grow up, their world gets bigger, things. Things, uh, uh, more experiences happen, but, but they can grow up in what we would call perfection toward adulthood. Because the, the word perfection means completeness. So a five-year-old is as complete as a five-year-old can be. Now, you know, in many, many churches when I grew up, we expected a brand new believer to come in the next Sunday... Right. Amen. Yeah, a whole new wardrobe. Whole new, wardrobe, mm -hmm. whole new way of talking. Yep. Whole new way of acting. Mm -hmm. And if they got a good case of the Holy Ghost, that would be what it would happen. <laughs> and yet, you know, we never we failed to understand that this is a growth, it is a step by step. Yeah. Amen. What new ones need is they need care. Mm -hmm. right. They need encouragement. Yeah. They need to be fed. <coughs> They need to be they need to be pampered a little bit. That's what new ones do, you know, and as they grow up, you know, hopefully they'll grow out of all of that and won't need that. But I've fo I, look, I've seen folks who've been in church for 20 years and still want to be pampered. They're no more stronger in God, they're no more adult in God, they're no more mature in God. They're they're a 25 year old still acting like a 15 year old. Demanding their way, wanting what they want, rather than understanding what God really wanted to do in their life. So, and I use the illustration in discipleship. I've got two apples here. I got one little green apple, and I got one big red juicy apple. And I always ask them the question, which one's perfect? Well, I didn't give them all the information. They'd say, Well, the, the red juice. No, no, no. I didn't give you all the information. You see, the little green apple is as perfect as it can be in June. The nice red juicy apple is as perfect as it can be in October. You don't go to the tree in June and expect to see a mature apple. So when the Lord looks at your life and mine, when I say perfection or completeness is relative to how long you've had to grow. That's why the Bible says, be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, that word perfection means complete, whole. <clears throat> So that is a gradual step by step as you and I conform to the image of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a step by step. It's a day by day thing. That you and I are growing and developing in the very image 
of Jesus Christ. So perfection is, is relative to how long you've had to grow. Now the problem is, is if you've been around a long time and you've not grown much, I will tell you, I don't have time to get into it, God, God will do something about that. <laughs> Just as a, like a good parent, that their child is not developing like they should, they're going to do something about that. Why? Because the parent's goal is to help that child become a mature adult, right? right. And the Lord is committed to yours and my growth in Him. Amen. He is committed. And as our Heavenly Father, He's committed. That's what Paul said. I'm persuaded that what God started in me, He is able to finish. So just because somebody's dragging their feet doesn't mean God's going to just twiddle his thumbs. Oh, no. He's going to work on that person to help them to grow in Christ. So we're looking at the fourth aspect here of scriptural praying. Well, let's conclude with this. There are four ways to get started and keep going. These are suggestions that will help you in this aspect of scriptural praying. Uh, <clears throat> number, number one would be when bringing scripture into your devotional hour, Ask God to bless His Word to your spiritual body. Ask God to bless His Word to you. Just as He blessed natural food to your physical body, the spiritual food needs to be blessed to our, uh, our bodies. It's not enough just to intellectualize the Word of God. God wants us to experience His Word. Amen. That's what I said a couple weeks ago. I was, and, and I was telling Brother Rick it, that, that principle that I shared a couple weeks ago about the Word becoming flesh came to me while I was teaching. And I was sharing the Word of the Lord. And the Lord dropped it in my heart. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Before, it was just an idea. It was just a thought in the mind of God. But the Lord put flesh on that thought. And we beheld His glory. And the same is true with the Word of God. We can intellectualize the Word of God. We can read it and say, okay, I believe that. But until it is applied, until we experience that Word, right. until we experience the promises of God. And I think that's what praying the Scriptures is all about. Is <laughs> rehearsing in our spirit and our, and our souls the Word of God and the promises of God and then leading our prayer time to experience that promise of God. You see, I can tell you today, not by theory, that God never forsakes you. I can tell you that, not by just because I read it in the Word of God, but because I've experienced it. Right. I can persuade, I can convince, I can say, God will not leave you. He has never left me. And I can give witness to other folks who will say the exact same thing. So now, it's not just a theory, it's not just an idea. It's been made flesh in you and me. Amen. Amen. Examine a passage from either the Gospels, the Epistles, Psalms, or Proverbs. Look carefully for specific ways to apply each verse to prayer. So we just need to get into the Word. There was an old song that was, uh, uh, said, I'm glad you're into the Word. And they went on with this, and you're into the Word, you're into the Word. And he says, but I, I pray that the Word will get into you. Amen. And there is a difference. People can be in the Word, and the Word not in them. We need to experience the Word of God. We need to experience the promises of God. See, the reason I can tell you that God heals is because He healed me. Right. The reason I can declare to you the salvation is for everyone is because He saved me. I've experienced that word. All right, number three. As you study a verse or verses, ask yourself what petition this passage prompts you to make. What request, as you read that, prompts you to make? Or what promise this passage contains that stands directly behind a specific petition? You're asking God for something, and here's the word of God that declares that you may possess that. It's the promise of God. It's praying the promises of God. And then finally, develop actual prayers based on the thoughts and phrases included in a verse or verses. 
of Scripture and offer those prayers confidently to the Lord. So we're taking the Word of God and we're asking God to have His way with our hearts and our lives. Praying the Scripture. <coughs> looking at it. I don't know if you underline your Bible or not, but you should. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Because as you read, there are going to be passages that's, that speak to you. You know, I, I just opened up my Bible. It's Proverbs 23. I've underlined this one passage, verse 23. Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy also wisdom and instruction and understanding. It's going to cost. How do we buy the truth? You get into the Word. And you allow the Word to get into you. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost some effort. It's going to cost some diligence. But I can stand here and tell you that it, you're going to reap wonderful rewards and blessings by doing what God's Word says. So let me, let it, let's encourage each and every one of us to do more Scripture praying. To find those promises in God for the believer and apply it to our own life. Lord, this is what you said. And I just know that the Lord said, you know, if you hunger, you shall be filled. Are you thirsty? You shall be filled. If you ask, if you seek, and you knock in prayer, the needs that you have in your life, first and foremost, your spiritual needs, and then secondly, your material needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. Well, He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He said, all the gold is mine and all the silver is mine. Everything is mine. It belongs to me. So God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Mm -hmm. Well, let's bow our heads together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the wonderful truth of praying the scriptures and the promises that you have given us. Lord, how wonderful it is to give us your word that never passes away, that never changes, regardless of the generation or the decade or the century or the millennium. Your word is always true. It is always right. It is powerful. It is quick. It never returns void. Lord, may we in our prayer increase the Word of God, claiming those promises, praying those promises, believing those promises, and incorporating those promises into our daily life. May we grow and develop as You would have us grow. May we be all that you would have us to be as we move toward your image. We ask these favors in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen.